and then uh, we'll highlight a couple of things. So it says, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, tell him the Lord needs it. It's convenient, huh? Have that power. <laughs> Verse 32, it says, Those who were sent, uh, sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying this? And they replied, The Lord needs it. Verse 35, they brought it to Jesus. They threw their uh, cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Then he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Verse 38 says, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground. You and the children within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Then he entered the temple area, began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house would be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find a way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, just open up our minds. Uh, help us uh, not to be spiritually blind like this people, Lord. And so, Father, I pray that you just awaken our senses, um, our minds, our hearts, Lord, to the things that you're doing in and around our lives, Father. Many times they just look more like problems, and the reality is they're, they're, more, they're opportunities. So, Father, open up our eyes, Lord. Help us to see clearly. It's my hope and my prayer, Lord, that we could see things as you see them, Father. That's the greatest clarity we could possibly have, is to see other people and to see circumstances and to see life the way that you see it, Lord. So, Holy Spirit, we ask you for supernatural perspective. And the things you don't want us to see, help us to be okay with that and just trust in your leadership. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, Palm Sunday is actually pretty confusing. You have this scene where we, that we just read about where he showed up, they got the palms, they're waving them around, they take the cloaks, they throw it down. And, uh, you know, <laughs> don't try this, you know, with a nice car in the parking lot, oh, my master needs it, you know, and try and take it, like, don't do that. It's a crazy thing. Um, and then they're praising and giving thanks, and the leaders, religious leaders are like, man, like, you know, you shouldn't allow this. And, and Jesus says, man, if, if I tell them to stop, the, the stones are going to cry out. And then, from there, he starts weeping, talking about what's going to happen. And then, he switched gears right from that very moment, and he heads right for, we'll just call it the church, he calls it the temple, but in those days, I right, didn't really have church like the way we have it set up now. So he goes to the temple, for the second time, because he did it earlier in his ministry, and apparently the first time he did it, it didn't stick. He goes back again, says, what are you guys doing? This is not like a money-making place. That's not our focus here. But they had made a focus there, and unfortunately the church for a long time, like even to this day, they just, the church has a real problem with money and with prayer. Money and just with being faithful. And so, you know, he goes in there and sets that same thing straight and then he, you know, really walks into the last week of his life encountering all kinds of different things. To where they're praising him, 
on this day, and then by the end of the week, you know, they're yelling, just crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. So, the reality is, so if you read that, and you look at that, and you think, oh, wow, that was obviously an amazing day, Palm Sunday, when he entered, they were praising Jesus, that's a really good thing. And the truth is, that's kind of true. It was good that he was getting praised and recognized for being Messiah and the Son of God. Literally for the first time in his entire earthly ministry, the first time ever he was really being treated the way he was really supposed to be treated, happened right then and there. The sad thing is that they were completely blinded by their own personal ambitions, hopes, and dreams. So you have this situation where there's this extreme celebratory moment and they were totally missing it. So for me, that's super sobering. So I think about people in church or go to studies or conferences and just get around Christian things and Christian situations. And they could be like celebrating with the arms like up in the air. They could be like in on it and going to the groups and doing all this stuff. And be totally blinded by the reality of who Jesus is and what he's really doing. Isn't that like kind of sobering? What that does for me is that like I realize that I'm not a lot different than those people that are there. I, I, I'm, not, I'm no different. I'm a human just like that. And sure, I got the Spirit of God living inside of me, so I want to leverage that. But at the same time, I still have the same dysfunctions and problems with my own personal flesh. To where a lot of times, it's easy for me, and maybe it's easy for you, to see God and say, yeah, He's my God who's going to fix things for me and make things easier. And when that happens, man, I can praise Him. And that's just, it's so far from the reality of his plans and purposes and will for our life. They were completely blinded by political ambitions that they hoped for their country. And listen, that could be a whole sermon for another day. To be completely blinded by politics and miss the central work of the church and Jesus Christ of what he's trying to do. That's a great sermon for another day. But it's not really today. So the reality is, like, for myself and for you, when we were born, God had unique, specific, beautiful plan of purpose, will, and destiny. That's right away just amazing news right then and there. Like, we didn't happen by accident. It wasn't an accident that, you know, the sperm hit the egg and that I came out of that. It wasn't by accident. There's some design behind that. There's some purpose there. There's some creativity there. There's some intentionality there. And so the very fact that you're even alive and breathing and occupying space on this earth is not by accident. And so sometimes we can get caught up like with our jobs and with the things that we do and think that, well, that's who we are and that's what I'm put on this earth for. And that is not true. But right? we're put on this earth to reveal part of what God's nature and part of what his heart is like. That's a tremendous privilege. And the reality is, is that God has this awesome, awesome plan, purposes, desires for our lives. And it's not just one thing, by the way. Like, I, I kind of want to, like, go after that first. There's not, like, this one thing that you just have to rise up to and it's like, this is the coveted plan, will, and desire. And you have to get there and, and get that thing and become that. I'm going to tell you something, like, he has plans, wills, hopes, and desires for all of your seasons of life. And they come in so many different levels, varieties, shapes, and forms. So it's not like this one overwhelming thing that hopefully you get and not miss. It comes at so many different places along the way. And it looks like so many different things. So he has these wills, plans, purposes, and desires. And the reality is, not everybody gets to experience that. Not everybody gets to experience it. It's not like God says, you know what? I'm going to create you. You're going to be born. I have you know, this will, this purpose, this plan for your life. 
and it's just going to happen. That's not the way that it works at all. Just like God is not going to be like, you know what, I'm going to populate the earth, you know, with, with homes, I'm going to build houses. No, what he does is he provides, like, the trees, right? He provides all the necessary, you know, he provides Home Depot and Lowe's. Everything that's needed and necessary, but the reality is none of that stuff gets put together or happens until people actually engage and do it. So there's things laid out for my life and for your life, but... Right? We're called to partner with what He wants to do. And the reality is, we're going to... There's some things, obviously, that we can't do without God's help. Amen? Very true. There's also things that God will not do until we partner with Him. Like at least, yeah, I got two on that. That's always the one where hardly anyone will say amen on that. But that's the reality. There certainly are things in our lives that God has brought into our life that... You know, we just can't, it's, it's impossible, it's not going to happen. And then there's other things that he is waiting for us to say yes and embrace in partnership. And unless we do that, it won't happen. And so it can get confusing and difficult for us when we're like, oh, well, if it looks easy and if it looks like I can see a way or it can happen, yeah, I'll say yes to that. And that's not the way God works. The way it works for God and for the believer is we say yes at the beginning. We say yes at the beginning and say, you know what? Through God's strength and His mercy, we'll find a way to end up where He's taken me. I don't know how, but He will. And then typically when we respond in faith like that, on the back end, we'll start to experience the supernatural partnership we're really involved in. And so when we live a life of that grid and that type of understanding, it doesn't leave a lot of room for the spiritual blindness that they were suffering from. Because we can all like fall victim to this thing. And so it's my hope and my prayer that, you know, we feel that. And like we sense that. Because here's the thing. So Jesus is crying in the middle of their celebration. Is that like not odd to anyone else? Like for the first time, he's really getting treated the way he's supposed to be treated as King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And he's weeping and crying. And the reason why he's weeping and crying is because they do not get it. Their spiritual blindness is completely costing them. And it's actually really expensive. So expensive that it's actually going to cost them their nation. So Jesus says, he says, I see, you know, this area uh, encamped around and people are going to be around and there's going to be severe famine and people are going to die. And he says, man, if you only you responded to the peace that's before you now, you could have avoided that. So I want you to think about this. Jerusalem is the name. Jerusalem, you translate that, it means peace. That's what it means. And then you have the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ Himself. And then you have them declaring prophetically Psalm 118 verses 25 to 26 that we read in the beginning of church. Save us, save us. Blessed is the one that comes in the name of the Lord that sets us free. Also, you take it one step further. And we can't unpack all of it today, but I really encourage you this week at some point to just read it. In Daniel chapter 9, it talks about how the coming Messiah is going to come and it gives these dates and it gives figures. And most Bible scholars, and I'm in the same opinion, most Bible scholars believe that the appearance of Jesus Christ is to the day, 483 years exact, to the prophecies of Daniel 9. And so now you have on Palm Sunday, when Jesus is like, okay, this is okay now. You have the supernatural provision of this cult. Like, we're, you know, just go take it. It's fine. Really? Yeah, just go take it. It's fine. Okay. And they're like, what are you doing? Oh, my master needs it. And there's like, no fight. Okay. Right? Fulfilled Zechariah 9. Says it was going to happen. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. This is rich with prophecy on Palm Sunday. And then you have, he rides into Jerusalem, the town of peace, 
the Prince of Peace riding into the town of peace 483 years later to the day when the Messiah is supposed to show up. And guess what? They missed all of it. All of it. The entire thing was out the window. You know all that they could see? We're going to be set. We're going to have our own nation. We're going to be our own people finally again. We're going to be, have our own thing here. He's going to be our king. He's going to establish himself. He's going to overthrow Rome. We're going to be our own deal. And listen, they didn't have a bad intention. And to be honest with you, that's also part of God's plan. But they had the timing all off. It's really easy for us to get the timing off. They had the timing all off. So their ambitions and their hopes and their dreams completely hijacked the work that was happening literally right in front of them in the moment. Isn't that crazy? There's a historian who's not a Christian. His name's Josephus, and he's like a contemporary of that time. And um, a lot of times we like refer to Josephus because one, he's not a Christian, which means that he doesn't have really, you know, the Christian skin in the game where he's trying to be biased and get people to go a particular way. He's like, you know, a source that just recorded history. And so what he said, as he recorded, you know, at this time, because he was a contemporary, so 40 years later then, this is what Jesus was crying about, it's what he saw. He saw 40 years later, and he saw the pain and the turmoil that, you know, Jerusalem is going to be going through. Over a million people. So Josephus says, All hope of escaping was now cut off from the Jews. Together with their liberty of going out of the city, uh, then did the famine widen its progress and devour the people by whole houses and families. The upper rooms of women and infants uh, were dying by famine, and the lanes of the city were full of the dead bodies of the aged, the children also. The young men wandered about the marketplaces like shadows, all swelled with the famine, and they fell down dead wherever their misery seized them. For a time, the dead were buried, but afterwards, when they could not do that, they had cast them down from the wall into the valleys beneath. And then it just talks about more of like, as far as like what it was like and what was going on. So that gives us a little bit better of a sense as far as what was going on in Jesus' heart, you know, when they're celebrating. Like, I'm sure he was partly like, wow, like, this, this is good, this is happening. This is prophetically playing out the way God had intended. But the hearts of the people are so far from what God is doing right now. And God is calling us to be a people to where our hearts are really closely aligned to what he's doing right now. But for a lot of people, we have our hearts and our minds set somewhere else on some other thing and we're really resistant to settling down and sitting down and focusing on what the Lord might be doing right in front because we don't love what's happening right in front of us. And the reality is, if we would say yes to the things that are unfolding in front of us, our intimacy would just grow in an unbelievable way. And we would love what the future looks like because now we get to see it in partnership through what he wants to do. So it's sobering but exciting at the same time. And the reality is we have been given the Holy Spirit. We don't have to fall victim to missing out on the current work of the Spirit in our lives. The current work of the Spirit in our lives, like, listen, you know, so God is sovereign, right? He's in full control. Things also come into our lives that He just allows. But He never allows it without any type of purpose, without any type of plan. Never. And most of the challenges that God has allowed into our lives, there is a purpose and a plan for that. And most of us, we see it as a problem or a thing we can't wait to have over. And God is saying, no, no, no. I'm actually doing something beautiful and amazing that I'm developing and cultivating. Just say yes to my process in it. Receive my grace. Declare my truthfulness. Stay close to my heart. You'll experience what I'm truly like. And we're like, no, it's too hard. It's too painful. Let's do it another way. Give me another marriage. Give me some other kids. Give me the other job. And we just want to quit things when they're difficult. But 
the reality is those are opportunities for us and I just don't know how good we are I want to be better at seizing those opportunities and those moments in faith I want to grow in that area and I hope that you want to grow in that area I don't want to be the Palm Sunday story I don't want that to be the story of my life I was busy praising God and saying hallelujah when things were working out and playing out to the way that I figured I want the story of my life being I was praising and singing hallelujah regardless of whatever the season was because I was trusting in faith that God is good that he's ordained my steps and I can entrust myself to his leadership and yeah stuff is hard and stuff is difficult but that's not the main thing that's not the thing that controls my life I don't want to be that type of person and I know deep down you don't want to be that type of person either God has filled you with a strength He's filled you with an ability to navigate. And He's filled you with His Spirit. And guess what? It's a resurrecting, victorious Spirit. And when stuff is tough, it's, it's for a season. It's for a season. And the beautiful thing, it's never without purpose. Never at all. So here's a couple things that I thought might be helpful. I put some do's and do nots, okay? Here's a great way to start on this. A great way to start is daily. I think daily is really helpful. Daily, at some point, you sort of get away from the nonsense or the craziness. You might have to escape to the bathroom, you might have to run out to your car, walk outside, whatever it is. But you have to get away from the craziness. And I know I'm saying this during Easter season, I get that. And that doesn't mean that like it's a pass, that means you still do it. But daily, you just declare and you say, how do I write it down? Daily de declare just a surrender of your will. You say, Father, today is yours. It is not mine. I'm choosing to follow you in your way. And I will get confronted with other things today and other paths. And I want to say no, so help me. Just do that one simple thing. Forget everything I said today. Just do that one thing. Seriously, you do that one thing and you mean it. And you declare it with your mouth and you give it over to the Lord. Your life and your perspective will change dramatically. Because experiencing God's will and His purposes and His plans lies in the fact that like, He's given us this free will because He loves us. I mean, if I'm locked into a marriage with Julie and I say, like, I love her, but I never have a choice to not love her, it doesn't really mean a whole lot, does it? Sure doesn't. And I want my kids, like, to love me because they want to love me. I don't want them to love me because i got to force them and spank them to do it. But if it's that. And so it comes into that voluntary, like, when we choose to declare with our mouths that Father, like, I'm turning my will and my wants and my desires over to you, your way. You're vocalizing that you love Him and that you care primarily about His plans and His purposes more than you do yours. There's no greater love where you're choosing to submit it. And listen, He'll give us the desires of our hearts. Like, that's promised in Scripture. So it's not like we lose on that deal. So the enemy tries to, like, plant those lies that you will lose if you do this or things will become so bad that you'll have no way out, those are lies. They are lies. I'm telling you, they are lies. It's not true. I'll tell you what is true, though. Much of those times, you will not be able to accomplish it in your own strength. That is true. So if you hear that whisper, that one is true. And then you say, you're right. I can't do my own strength. But I know that God will give me the strength. He will make me able. He will be able to change the situation. So maybe he's not changing the job right now, but guess what? It's in my heart of hearts, and he's got me going somewhere else. I want to trust myself to whatever the new job season might look like. I'll do the best I can with my current boss. They don't want to see it. They don't want to be around it. Fine. I'll still give my best, but I'll be looking in the meantime. Right? There's particular ways to go about life in faith where we entrust our process to his leadership. So that's a really helpful do where you just daily declare, say, Father, I give my life and everything that's going to happen today over to you. I want it to worship you. I want it to glorify you. I want to be taken to new places. 
when I love people, I want it to be, I want it to go further than just a random act of kindness. You guys with me? Here's the other thing. If we can not do this, sometimes we're really good at when we get a picture as far as what God's doing in our lives and the way He's shaping us. We can become in our flesh very good at saying, here's what I don't have, here's what I don't have, and here's what I can't do. This is what I'm missing. These are the important pieces, and I don't have it. And in our flesh, we can become extremely well-versed in that. So much so that it can justify our lack of faith in the moment. And it gives the appearance of wisdom. It gives the appearance like you're being very logical. You're being smart. The other side starts with what we do have and what we are able to do. Father, you have me in this current situation. I feel like you're drawing me over here. I do not see how that connects. But I'll take steps of faith. I'll entrust myself to your leadership. So you want me to lead a Bible study? I'll start learning like, what, how do you lead a Bible study? How do you talk about I need to start reading my Bible. Shoot, like. You want me to parent this particularly different way? Fine, I'll take steps towards doing that. You want me to look at money like this particular way and handle it differently? I've always done it this way. Okay. And then you start to take steps towards doing that. Instead of, well, I don't have any money, so I can't do this. And I can't give, and I can't go there, and I can't do this. Well, guess what? There are multiple ways where you can give and can serve exactly where you're at. God would never call us to do things that He has not already equipped us to do. Never. Never, never. And so there's a big change and a big shift from what I don't have, what I can't do, to... All right, I just I gotta figure out a way to work with what I got. Because it's a real lie to think that when we get more, then we can do more. Bless you. Because the reality is, if we're not making the choices for what we really want to be about now, when we get more later, we're not gonna do it later. We can tell ourselves we will, but we won't. We won't. Here's the other thing you don't want to do. When it comes to like, what's God's will for my life? What does He want me to do? What's going on in this current situation? Here's what you want to really want to try hard to avoid. Do not run to someone else first. To say, hey, what is God? Giving them the whole spiel, giving them all the details, and all down there. What do you think God wants me to do? Don't do that first. Don't do it first. How about we start right here? Well, it's not going to tell me. Well, you'd be surprised. Lose yourself in here first, right? And that'll just naturally just bring you to your knees. If you're truly really in that. If you're not just trying to check off a box when you do it. It'll bring you to your knees. And then, you know what? I can pretty much guarantee you, God will bring someone else into your life that you can share some of this stuff with. And now you're not looking for an answer from them. You're looking for a partnership with them. You're like, hey, can you pray with me on this? Like, can we just like process this together? I don't want you to answer anything for me. I just need a trusted voice in my life that I can bounce ideas off of and just process together. Super healthy, really good, and almost never happens on a regular basis among God's people. Isn't that scary? We can do better, like we're called to do better. We're called to do better. So when I think about Palm Sunday, I think about, man, a group of people that just totally missed. Missed it. Completely blinded by what they really wanted in their core. And I don't think what they really wanted in their core was a bad thing. I'm not saying that. But I am saying they wanted it so bad that they were missing the obvious signs of what God was doing right before them. He was doing something beautiful and amazing right before them. And it definitely wasn't the way that they wanted. And uh, it was definitely the more difficult way. But that's what was happening. So it's my prayer and it's my hope that we will be a people that our eyes, man, they're 
we're asking for the Father to just open our eyes. Father, what are you doing before me? Because it looks like this to me, but it might not look like that to you. So speak to my heart. Show me, Father, before my emotions enter into this thing and it brings me all over the place and I allow certain things into my mind, I want to be able to see it as you see it, Lord. And I can't pray that for you. Nobody can pray that for you. That's something that has to come out of your own mouth that you bring before the Father. And He's going to answer our hearts. And He'll be faithful and true. And that's where the hope really comes in and where it becomes really exciting. And guess what? We start to live a life like that. It builds up a history of true partnership of what God's like. And guess what? You have some neighbors over to the house one day. Start talking about stuff somehow like God comes up. Man, you got something really meaningful to now contribute other than like trying to parrot whatever you just heard in your latest Bible study or preacher or whatever. You got some stories of partnership that you get to share. And you're not trying to like save them in the moment. You're just trying to give God's heart of what He's like and let that seed just simmer in them. You see what I'm saying? That's a really healthy way to go about it. So... That's all I got for Palm Sunday. And, uh, yeah, thanks. But I mean, but the reality is I just want us to see clear, you know? And I don't think, like, God wants to keep it a riddle. He does what? He desires intimacy. He desires connection. Like, we're a people of connection. We've been saved to be close to Him. And sometimes we give our lives to the Lord and we just try, and especially, like, you know, Easter and it's busy and it's crazy and it's hectic. Oh man, it's really difficult to make that space and to make that time. But I want to see this Easter season as the Lord is seeing it. I want to see this Easter season as God sees it. I want to notice opportunities when I think they're honestly like problems, hindrances, inconveniences. And so I don't know what things are going to come up. Maybe I'll get in a car accident, maybe I'll get some speeding tickets. Maybe you'll get some kind of like medical report. Maybe you're going to lose a friend. Maybe some people close to you make some bad decisions. Maybe you'll get gossiped about. I'm not seeing all these things as problems that are going to make your life worse. I'm seeing them as opportunities where you can rise up in faith and entrust yourself to the situation and just turn your will over to His and see what He does. So, Father, I just, uh, we just come before you, Lord, just as a group of people, Lord, just hungry for your plans and for your will, Lord. And sometimes our vision and our perspective can get hijacked by some good things inside of us, but it's not always the best, Lord. And so I ask you, Holy Spirit, for fresh vision, supernatural perspective. Father, that we would actually be able to be really clear and articulate about what you're doing in our current season of life. Where you're moving and, and who you're moving in and, and just what's going on around us, Lord. So, Father, I just pray for each person here that you'd open up their minds, Lord. That you'd help them, Lord, to take courageous steps of faith in their own personal lives, Father. To choose to embrace partnership above all else. I thank you that your plans for us are beautiful and they're perfect and they're better than we could ever imagine. And we just ask you, Heavenly Father, to see and experience more of that goodness, Lord, in our life as we partner with you. Fill this house with stories of victory and celebration as your people chose to just surrender to you to deeper levels. We didn't put it on other people, Lord. We went to you first. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So.